bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, praise yes. and all that is within me. Yes. Bless his holy name. What a victory. What a victory. Amen. This morning, it's just been one great celebration of that glorious victory. He is risen. Glorify you. I'm going to say it again. He is risen. Bless you. Amen. Amen. What else can you preach on this Sunday morning? Nothing else, but he is risen. Yes. And if you have your Bible, will you turn with me, please, to the Gospel of Matthew, the 28th chapter, beginning to read at verse 1 to 8. And I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Thank you, Pastor Tom, for the privilege of bringing God's Word on this Resurrection Sunday. And a many happy returns for tomorrow. I will, know, I will, I will embarrass you of your age. <laughs> First one. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to draw, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was lightning and his clothes, clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you so. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. And they went telling his disciples, Behold, Jesus met, saying, Rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. For God always blesses the reading Bless your name, of his inspired word. What a mighty God we serve. Can we pray together, Amen. shall we? Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious, precious word. This powerful story, this life changing story that you have risen from yes. the dead. This greatest fact of history that Jesus is alive. Our sins are forgiven. The work is finished. He has done it. Death is beaten. And you are beckoning us to come and follow you. Lord, I pray for your people. Pray for those who are gathered here, those who are watching online. Lord, will you touch? Lord, will you bless? Lord, we thank you for Rebecca's testimony of victory. We thank you for the time of worship and the time around your table. And Lord, will you hide me behind yourself that you will be seen, that you will be heard. And there's someone here who is cold in heart, who has fallen away from you or does not know you, that on this Resurrection Sunday, that they will experience the way, the truth, and the life that comes from you. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. He is risen. Yes. These three words change the lives of the disciples, change the lives of the people in Jerusalem, and today... Millions and millions and billions of people have been changed by these three words. He is risen. For these three words have turned the ancient world upside down and are still changing the world upside down today. Amen. Do you remember the book of Acts? The people that have, brought, have turned the world upside down have come here. Yeah. Let's go to Valley Salem. Let's go to our worlds. Let's go to our factories. Let's go to our communities. And turn them upside down yes. with these powerful truths. Oh. He is risen. Praise your name, Lord. Death could not hold him. The veil of the temple was torn. What a God we serve. Because the message, the message of the resurrection brings life. For why? For Christ is the resurrection and the life. Before I jump into the passage, do you know the life of Christ? 
and all he brings. Because he was born, born of man that no may die, as Charles Wesley sang or wrote, as, as we sing at Advent. He was born to redeem us. For the Son of Man came to serve and not be served, right. but gave his life as a ransom mm. for many. Every single person here, mm. you're one of that many. Mm. But do you belong to him? Mm. Verses 1 to 3. The Sabbath day, the first day of the week, a group of women were travelling to the tomb. And we read from the other accounts, they were wondering, well, how are they going to move the stone away? But Christ took care of that. You see, Christ always goes before. Remember, he says, I go before you. What situation in your life are you worried? He's gone before you. He's gone before you. And he'll be with you to the end of the age. And behold, there was a great earthquake. Now, out of all the gospel accounts of the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection, Matthew accounts only records this fact that the earth shook at both at Christ's passion, crucifixion, and at his resurrection, then to show that the earth could not bear his suffering, now to show it could not hinder his rising. The earth cried out, creation groaned because there is no grave that could hold his body down and on that day there is no grave that can hold us down the angel of the lord appeared now when he the angel appeared there's this greek word called the seismoth the great shaking of the ground and the guards some say there have been about 16 in a Roman guard patrol. This platoon of guards, these battle-hearted, fierce Roman words, they shook in fear at the sight of this angel. And there was confusion among them by the angel's appearance. And this all had taken place before the women had reached the tomb where our Lord lay. You see, the grave could not hold the resurrection of life when the stone was rolled away. That was the day that death died. Brothers and sisters, death has a death certificate. One day all of us will have a death certificate to our name or go to some go to the registry office to register the death of a beloved loved one. And it's not easy. I've been there. I remember travelling with my grandfather to the general registry office to register the death of my beloved grandmother. And we filled in all the details, name, age, showed the, the report of cause of death, and filled it in. But on that day, where Jesus rose from the tomb, he says, death has no claim over us. Death has no claim. And the angel sat on the stone, as one account writes, and there was nothing that could stop the plan of God which is sitting there. What stone is wrote need in your life needs to be rolled away? Because sin leads to death, and there's oh, so many sins that keeps us away from God. Sins separate us from a holy God, but Christ came and He re He reconciled, He took your hand in one. And the finger of God and the other. And on the cross he reconciled God and man. Thank you, Lord. I don't know what you've done. We've all done things we're not proud of. All of us. Pastor Tom mentioned about the charge sheet. And every one of us has a charge sheet. But guess what? <coughs> Through his finished work, all our sin and all our shame can be forgiven. Oh my God, I have struggled. I have slipped up. I have fallen. Listen, a righteous man, though may he falleth, he gets up and he cleans himself up through the finished work. You see, we couldn't get it right. But someone who did get it right came and did the work for us. He took our sin, he took our shame, and it's only by his name that we are forgiven. And it's only by his name that we are saved. And it's only by his name that we are kept. And it's only by his name we will reach our eternal hope. In verses 4 to 6, 
We've read about the guards shook for fear and became like dead men. That battle hard professional soldiers became like dead, dead men. This has never happened before. Or was this a, a great conspiracy? Conspiracy theories and movies and TV shows are now popular nowadays, aren't they? Conspiracy theories on Facebook and go far up. <laughs> How can someone rise from the dead? Well, I love this. I love talking about the resurrection, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is my favourite topic in all of scripture. And many years ago, I had the privilege of teaching apologetics. Now, what is apologetics? It's a reason's defence of our faith. As Peter says, always be ready to give an apology mm. for your faith and apologetics. And many years ago, I had a privilege of teaching about 61 young people on one Saturday night about the resurrection and the proof of resurrection. And if there's any sceptics here, let, open your ears and open your hearts and know that your faith or the faith that you could have is based on the firm facts because it's based on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. Amen. A historian called A.N. Sherwin White, I can almost pronounce his name, argues that the passage of two generations of time was not enough for our legends to be wiped out by a solid core of historical truth. There was a journalist in Chicago, Tribune, called Lee Strobel, who was an atheist, and he was seeking to disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ after his wife's conversion to, Jesus, conversion to Christ. He spent the best part of two years trying to disprove it, but only, only came to know Christ Amen. as his Lord and personal Saviour. It is important to note that Matthew again, who was a Jew, was writing to a Jewish audience notes of the Romans guards. They would have been familiar of the guards as they were soldiers posted throughout the city. These guards, if they had left a body be stolen or fall asleep on duty, they would all have been put to death. Because if one suffered, they all did. Corporal responsibility. <clears throat> in verse 5 we read but the angel answered and said to them do not be afraid for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified now the angel the angel were sent to the there because they needed to see they needed to speak to these women first of all do not be afraid can you imagine that sight <laughs> a stone was rolled away the crucifixion, there was a great darkness over the earth, the, the offence are still fresh in their mind, and there is this angel. Now you might say, this is impossible, perhaps they were hallucinating, them getting themselves all worked up. Well, let's look at what a hallucination means. Hallucination means seeing something else and mistaking it for what you are actually looking for. Am I right? That's the definition of what a hallucination is. And if we look at our New Testament record of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his subsequent appearance, you get the opposite. For instance, at the tomb, one gospel account right, reads that Mary saw Jesus. And guess what? We're sticking for the gardener. Mm -hmm. Or my other favorite story in the resurrection accounts was the two on the road to Emmaus. They saw Jesus and thought he was what? A stranger. Can I also mention this? I love the honesty of the disciples because they're just like you and me. And one of my favourite disciples is called Thomas. And can I be honest, all of us are just like Thomas, aren't we? We all have a little bit of doubt. Yeah. We all have that tiny bit of scepticism, don't we? Is it really what he said? Thomas was a defeatist. Thomas said, unless I see the nail pierced hands and pierced to touch his side, I will believe. And we read that in John's Gospel, at verse 26, it says, After eight days, the disciples were again in sight, and Thomas said, or Thomas was with them. And Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach out your finger here, look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Jesus, or Thomas answered, said to him, My Lord and my God. Not only did Thomas believe, he believed, but he first 
need to recognize that Jesus is God? Do you recognize yourself as Thomas did? And then Jesus said to him in verse 29, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. And what did Thomas do? He spread the gospel throughout the ancient world all the way to India and suffered a martyr's death. He proclaimed this absolute skeptic became a devout believer, spread the message of truth, and many lives were changed, and it's an ongoing effect. But to those who still believe that this is a big, elaborate conspiracy, and many people have tried to disprove this claim, but the claim that we hold dear, as C.S. Lewis says, that the earliest evidence of Christendom is based that many people have seen Jesus risen from the dead is based on solid evidence for the empty tomb. We have the crucifixion, the empty tomb, the eyes, the eyewitnesses, the, the growth of the church. N.T. Wright says this, in the ancient world, the crucifixion was almost like a swear word. It was so horrible and barbaric. And yet Christians made this cross the symbol of their movement from the very beginning. Without the death of Jesus, the cultural shift is impossible to explain. Think about it. Our saviour hung on a criminal's cross between two thieves. Hung the blameless Prince of Peace. Both of them mocked him. But one of them said, he has done nothing wrong. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he has done hit with him in paradise. And when Jesus died, the soldiers pierced his side with spear, stabbing him in the chest. And we read, as one account writes, that blood and water came out together out of the wound. Around the heart sat there's called the pericardium, which holds a thin water sear that the spear must have pierced the heart. The water, visible evidence that the spear had punctured the pericardium. Sorry, darling, I cannot pronounce that word, but it was a, it was a, I tried. <laughs> the eyewitnesses have noticed that all who saw the risen Lord at the beginning were women. Mary and another Mary. All women. Why is that? Well, women in the first century weren't treated with respect and dignity and reliability. In fact, why is this important? Well, Margaret Manning notes in both Josephus in the first century, the Jewish historian notes that Talmud, that a woman's testimony is considered, now this is his words, not my words before you call the council brigade on me. This, this is what somebody else has said before the keyboard warriors report me. That a woman's testimony is considered unreliable at best, but let not the testimony of women be admitted on account of their lividity, their boldness of their gender, since it's probably that they may not speak the truth, either out of hope of gain or fear of punishment. That's what the ancient Talmud states. They didn't treat women's uh, reliability with much respect. Yet, the first evangelist of the risen Lord was a woman. And they went and told the disciples. And the disciples... They just couldn't understand this. In fact, they ran and looked and saw the tomb was empty. There was a cultural change. And the testimony offers an unexpected, apologetic answer for every generation of, the seek, of who are seeking truth. Because Christianity later became mocked for being so pro-women. Because at that point, a historian wrote, wrote in the second century that two-thirds of the church were women. Women were doing all forms of ministry and evangelism. And one of my personal heroes of the faith was a woman called Amy Carmichael. And she said this, Life begins at the end of your comfort zone. What's holding you back from going deeper with the Lord? Is it is a family? Is it the fact that you think, well, I'm a bit more mature in years. Give God your life and he can do it. Now, most of you might know this about me, but I'm 
I'm a nerd. I'm on, I'm, I love to read. I love being a bookworm. I love biographical films. My wife loves a good chick flick. You know, and sometimes we know we, we come to an agreement, you know, we watch that many chick flicks and then we watch a biodrama. Isn't that right? You know, mm -hmm. pe period dramas and stuff like that. <laughs> and I have been rereading the life of Charles Colson, the founder of Prison Fellowship. Before that, he was in the powerful White House in the Richard Nixon administration. Perhaps somebody might remember the drama of it, of the Watergate scandal in the 1970s and the break in into the Watergate convention. And because of that break in, every scandal has the word gate. The most recent one, party gate. Or if you're a Bake Off fan, Ben Gate. <laughs> he says this about Watergate and how, for him, show the proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's so powerful, I want to read it to you. In Watergate, there were 10 powerful men in the United States that held the privilege, the power, and the prestige. These were the top men. These were the top dogs. They had everything. He said this, with all the power, we couldn't contain a lie for two weeks. He says, as I know, the resurrection is a fact and the Watergate scandal proved it to me because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead then proclaimed that truth for 40 years never once denying it everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned and put in prison they would not have endured it if it weren't true Watergate embroiled 12 the most powerful men in the world and they couldn't keep a lie for 3 weeks you're telling me 12 apostles could keep a lie for 40 years absolutely impossible yeah. now I've established that Jesus did die yeah. was buried <coughs> and was rose again yes. where does that evidence sit with you mm. where does the truth sit with you does it affirm your faith does it strengthen your foundation where do you stand with it now we come to verse 6 he is not here for he is risen as he said come See the place where the Lord lay, the empty tomb. Now, I've had the privilege of going to Israel twice, and there's debate about is it the tomb of the sepulchre or is it General Gordon's tomb where our Lord was buried? Let me tell you something, it doesn't matter because he's not there. Right. As Pastor Tom reminded me, it reminded us, and it reminded me what when you were sharing the Lord's table, Pastor Tom, about a famous. Uh, Canadian, uh, George, or Canadian science, chemist, or chemist from a scientific community in Canada, he wrote about this. I can find the tomb of Buddha. I can find the tomb of Confucius. I can find the tomb of Muhammad. They are there. But when I come to the tomb of Christ, he's not there, Amen. for he is risen. When I was at Bible college on placement, we went to the garden tomb. As I entered the tomb, there was a man in front of me. He, there, well, I was talking to him. He came from Times Square Church. And he started to sing this. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I've shared it before, and I'll never get tired of sharing it. He started to sing, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a Christmas, Christmas, Christmas stain. Let me try it again. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And I would say it again. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. This morning, whoever you are, you can be washed whiter than snow. Now, how can you have whiter than snow? Alexander White talked about how someone came to him. How can you have snow that is whiter than snow? It doesn't work because snow gathers dust and and dirt and footprints and all sorts. But Christ washes you clean than anything in this world can do. Because nothing can clean your soul. Nothing can atone than the work of the cross. Amen. You can be forgiven. Thank you, Lord. Woody Allen, a famous American actor and atheist, once said he would like to hear God say to him, You are forgiven. This morning, you can walk out of this church knowing that your sins are forgiven. Your life is in his hands and you can walk in newness and with purpose 
and with joy and with victory, let Rebecca show how God was in her life from a young child and was working in her life and even those dark days in COVID, how God works all things together for good for them who love him. God, God works things all out. And there's things in my life I don't understand what on earth is happening. But one day I'll look back and see his hand, that nail pierced hand that was working in the background. That's right. Because, do you know what? He's already gone before. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Verses 7 to 8. And let me unpack this verse very quickly before we close. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out from the tomb with fear and great joy. And ran to bring the disciples the good news. Let me get a drink. Mark's account of the resurrection also says, Go, go and tell Peter, the disciples and Peter. Now let's think about this man called Peter. Peter said that he wouldn't deny the Lord, that he would die with him. And he would later deny him three times. And on the third time, he denied him with much swearing. And then he went out when the rooster crew and he wept bitterly. Is there someone here, and you're a backslider? And you said to yourself, I, I've let the Lord down. I've said things I shouldn't say. Mm. I've done things I shouldn't have done. I've watched things I shouldn't have watched. I have lost my temper. I have done things that I'm not proud of. God would be ashamed of me. Guess what? When Peter denied him three times to what our Lord did, he was still going three full with this question. Do you love me? That's right. Because of God's great unending love for you, he could restore you. You get right back on track. It doesn't oh, matter yeah. what you have done. Come, come and find forgiveness. Find mercy at the foot of the cross. There is mercy, abundant mercy. And as my mother often told me as a wee boy, God is more merciful than we give him credit. That's right. And then it says this, they remembered his words and they went out rejoicing because they've seen him and they held him by the feet and they worshipped him and they said do not be afraid, be afraid go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me do you know why? Christ is risen he is risen indeed oh sing hallelujah join the chorus sing with the redeemed Christ is risen he is risen with deed oh, yes. let me finish with a quote from a man called Mark Allen Parr he says, if as a Christian you want to believe Jesus was born to a virgin, that's fine. But as a story, you must recognize that <coughs> there, is a, there is proof that Jesus died, that he, was, that he was dead, and that his tomb was empty. And there is no grave that can hold him. You see, faith... Our faith is built on fact that the resurrection of Jesus Christ proves that death has died, sins are forgiven, and he brings life. <laughs> Jesus said, I have come that they have might have life and have it more abundantly. Are you living in that abundant life? Because this life, look at our world, this life's not the greatest. Our world's a mess. This life can be messy, but in his life there is abundance there is peace, there is joy, there is certainty that nothing in this world can satisfy. And if you are struggling to hold on, look to Christ. For Christ is risen and there is no grave that can hold him down. And there is no grave that can hold us down. Because the resurrection changes the lives of many. And I believe that it can change your life in the same way Jesus Christ changed mine. And as I close, Billy Graham once spoke to Winston Churchill, then Prime Minister, in 1955. After his famous London Crusades, he was asked to see the then Prime Minister. And Billy Graham notes that he went to this dim lit room at about three in the afternoon and the newspapers were sitting. And Churchill said, young man, I personally don't have any hope that this world is going to find peace. He said, look at the afternoon papers. They are filled with murder, violence, and talk of war. Nothing new under the sun, is there, folks? You just look, look at the news today. You see all these three and more. He says, do you have any hope? 
to give to an old man. And Mr. Graham said this, yes sir, and he had his New Testament open and he shared the biblical hope for peace lies in a person called the Prince of Peace yes. who defeated death and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. This morning, your life can be changed yes. by the Prince of Peace. He went to that cross. Yes. He reconciled God, God and man. He brought peace. Who is the Prince of Peace? As I said before, he can give your life peace. He can give your life purpose. He can give your life power. All you need to do is come to him as you are. For Christ is risen. Let us pray. Yes, Lord. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if there's someone here and you have drift, drifted away from the faith or have never come to know Christ as your Lord and Saviour and you want to get right with God, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and I know there are people praying, if there's someone here and you want to get right with God or come to Christ, will you raise your hand and I'll just say it and I'll pray for you. And it doesn't matter who you are or where you, what you've done or where you've come from. Now, if you want to get right with God, and you said, Michael, I've made mistakes. I've done things I shouldn't have done. I want to get right with God. Then this Easter Sunday morning, you can get right with God. You can get changed. You can get born again. You can have purpose. You can have life. I know I'm speaking mainly to believers, but should there be one? Perhaps you've fallen away. Perhaps you once loved him and your love has gone cold. I'm asking for the last time if there's anyone who wants to get right with God. Okay, friend, I'll leave that issue with you. Let me pray for you before we close. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you, Lord, that it is finished. He has done it. Death is beaten. And you call us. I thank you for your church. I thank you for your people. I ask you to bless Pastor Tom and the leadership team in the days ahead. I thank you, Lord, that you are risen, that death could not hold you, that the victory is yours, and we have this victory, and we have this hope. Lord, bless your people. Strengthen your people. I do not know what they're going through, but you do. Lord, if there is sickness, Lord, bring healing. Lord, if there's confusion, will you bring clarity? Lord, where there is trouble, will you bring in peace? And Lord, you are always ahead of us. You go before us. And most importantly, you are with us to the end of the age. Be with your people. Strengthen your people. And encourage your people. And may everything that is said and done bring glory and honour to your name. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Michael.